Welcome to the U.S. and the Holocaust Screening and Discussion Event. The U.S. and the Holocaust is brought to you by the William G. Pomeroy Foundation, which helps people celebrate their community's history by providing grants for historic markers and plaques nationwide. Information about Pomeroy Foundation grants and partnership opportunities is available at wgpfoundation.org. Support for this program is brought to you by the Jewish Community Center. The Jewish Community Center is all about families coming together with community, offering a variety of programs and services for people of all ages. Visit jccsyr.org. Guided by Jewish values, the Jewish Federation of Central New York works to build a strong Jewish future in Central New York, Israel, and worldwide through philanthropy, engagement, education, and advocacy. Hi, I'm Ken Burns. Thank you for attending this event for our newest film, The U.S. and the Holocaust. Our film examines the events leading up to and during this tragic period, dispelling the myths that the American people were entirely ignorant of what was happening to Jews in Europe, or that everyone looked on with callous indifference. Ultimately, the U.S. and the Holocaust explores how we as a country and as individuals responded to one of the greatest humanitarian crises in history. Storytelling is at the heart of public media, and we're honored to have the support of your local station, which makes it possible for us to tell the complicated American stories at the heart of the U.S. and the Holocaust. I, along with my co-directors Lynn Novick and Sarah Botstein, hope you have a chance to watch the full film on PBS starting September 18th. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Mitch Gelman, President and CEO of WCNY. Thank you for joining us for the U.S. and the Holocaust pre-screening and discussion. Tonight's event is in partnership with the Safe Haven Holocaust Refugee Shelter Museum and is sponsored by the William G. Pomeroy Foundation, Jewish Federation of Central New York, and Jewish Community Center of Syracuse. We're honored to bring you a vital film exploring one of the most important topics in recent history. The U.S. and the Holocaust is a three-part series that tells the story of how America grappled with one of the greatest crises of the 20th century and how this struggle tested the ideals of our democracy. The film delves into the American experience during the Holocaust through the eyes of citizens unsure of their place at the time. These questions of responsibility and resolve are ones that we remain all too familiar with today. We are fortunate that tonight's event features a panel discussion with Rebecca Erbelding, historian at the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum and author of Rescue Board. Michael Berenbaum, Distinguished Professor of Jewish Studies at American Jewish University. Doris Schechter, Fort Ontario Shelter Refugee and New York City Restaurateur. And Paul Lear, Historic Site Manager of Fort Ontario State Historic Site in Oswego. The discussion will be moderated by David Lombardo, host of WCNY's The Capitol Press Room and Connect New York. This evening, we will watch clips of the documentary followed by a live question and answer session with our panel. Thank you for joining us. We hope you enjoy this compelling documentary. Good evening and thank you for joining our advanced screening of The U.S. and the Holocaust, a film by Ken Burns, Lynn Novick, and Sarah Botstein, which will premiere on Sunday, September 18th at 8 p.m. right here on WCNY-TV. I'm David Lombardo, host of the Capitol Press Room and Connect New York. And for the next 45 minutes, we're going to have a live discussion reflecting on what we just saw and how it should shape our view of the world today. And to do all that, I'm joined in the studio with Doris Schechter, whose family was forced to flee Europe when she was just six years old and found refuge at Fort Ontario in Oswego, New York in 1944. And also with us is Paul Lear, a founding member of the Safe Haven Holocaust Refugee Shelter Museum and the historic site manager for the Fort Ontario Historic Site. And participating remotely, we have Dr. Rebecca Erbelding, an historian at the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum, and Michael Berenbaum, a distinguished professor of Jewish studies at American Jewish University. We're going to do our best to incorporate questions that we've received from the audience right here in the studio, as well as what we receive from viewers participating remotely. And with that, 
I want to turn to Doris with our first question, and that has to do with why do we do this at all? Nearly 80 years since the death of Adolf Hitler, why do we continue to revisit this chapter, and why do we explore America's role in this story? I think that um, it's very important for me anyway, because I see that at this point in my life, at this age that I'm at, it is so unbelievable to me that the past is always present at this point in my life. And it's very powerful. And I think that, especially with what was going on in the Ukraine, and watching the newsreels about that, and I see children have that, have been thrown out of their homes for no reason at all. And why is it that one despot can change completely the lives of parents, mothers, fathers, and especially children, because the trauma of what happened to them is ever present. And there's another part of it, I can only talk for myself, that I always felt growing up here in the United States of America, a certain feeling of shame and guilt that somehow or other that I had, had fault in all of this. And you know, when you think about that, that when you have to overcome this to realize that you are a person of valor, but always left with that feeling, what did I do yeah. to allow this to happen? What did I do? I did nothing. I was uh, a baby born in Vienna. My parents were upstanding citizens. And I felt so unbelievable. You know, when I was thinking about my father, that he knew that Jews were not welcomed in Vienna. And he went from embassy to embassy. Right. And finally, and no Jew wanted a Jew in their country, but finally Italy gave him a temporary visa. So we were, mm -hmm. we would live there for five and a half years. So you mentioned Ukraine, and that's obviously something that's been in the news more than ever over the last you know, six months. So Michael, I'm curious, when you think about the American response to the Russian invasion of Ukraine, what parallels, if any, are there to the American response to Adolf Hitler's march through Europe and the treatment of Jews? Well, I think uh, I want to say three things about it. The first um, is that we see something remarkable happening with regard to Ukrainian refugees, something that was not true of Jewish refugees who were trying to get out. And that is that the world has opened its arms to Ukrainian refugees. Uh, I was in Poland uh, shortly after the war began. And I saw, for example, that the schools were open to Ukrainian students who came in, that hospitals were providing medical care, that Poles were opening their home, that the borders were open, and that essentially these people were welcomed. Uh, contrast that, for example, with the restraint with which the United States has even received Afghani refugees who had helped the United States. So the question of what our responsibility is to refugees, to people who seek uh, a shelter from difficult times, and in the case of uh, Germany, especially once the Holocaust began, from near certain death, it tells you that there's a dramatic contrast within it. The United States uh, had the opportunity during the early years, and let's distinguish between 33 and 39, when the difference in life and death was a stamp in a passport, a visa that allowed you to go somewhere, and that's the way in which you escaped. The United States had the opportunity 
to open its gates. And when it did, it found that these people uh, benefited America enormously uh, in a tremendous, tremendous way. I live out in Los Angeles, and you have to see the transformation, for example, of the movie industry by the talent that came here. A young boy seeking refuge was a man by the name of Henry Kissinger. Another young boy seeking refuge was a man by the name of Max Frankel, became the managing editor of the New York Times. Guy Stern was the uh, provost of a major university, of three major universities. We opened ourselves, we welcomed these people. The second thing is that the Holocaust is not past. And this is what Doris said so profoundly. It echoes again and again. Part of the reason it's not past is because there's no full closure. In tragedy, what we learn balances the price that we paid for such knowledge. In atrocity, there is an imbalance between what we learn and um, the price that was paid for it. And the last is because everybody evokes the Holocaust. We have uh, Putin saying he's fighting against the Nazis. Ukraine can't be quite be the Nazis. It has a Jewish president whose father fought with the Soviet Union against Nazi Germany, whose grandfather was a victim of Nazi Germany. Uh, and that's being evoked. Uh, it's being evoked when you have all the comparisons. We have people comparing, for example, the vaccine cards to the Jewish star, one which protects us and the other which identified people, um, uh, ultimately targeted them for death and destruction instead of protecting them. So the Holocaust is not quite past, and we're trying to salvage from its ashes some lessons about humanity and about opportunity that are terribly essential to our collective future. So I want to stick with this comparison, though, between Ukraine and what we saw in the 30s. So, Rebecca, if America today was to respond to the crisis in Ukraine the way we did uh, back in the 30s with, with Jews and, I guess, non-responsiveness for the large degree in terms of a government response, what, what would this look like? Would it be a, a lot different than the way the government's responding uh, today uh, with regards to Ukraine? I think if, I think there is a, a tremendous difference between how the government is responding. One is that we are propping up the Ukrainian government. Um, we are giving them weapons. We are giving them support and humanitarian aid in a way that certainly was not done um, to the Jewish victims in the 30s or 40s, the refugees who were trying to escape or the Jewish communities that were trying to survive um, in and, the... And just to interject, and then I mean, the, a difference yeah. there could be the fact that one is a nation state and one was a group of religious people spread across multiple countries. Right, and that was a huge problem. And that was something that the State Department was grappling with in 1942 and the Treasury Department was pushing back on them in 1943 was how much aid can we provide, can we provide aid um, without fearing that that will interfere with the successful prosecution of the war, that that, that money won't fall into the hands of the enemy. Um, and so those were absolutely questions that the US government was grappling with in 1942 and 1943. Now, now we have much more sophisticated tools, both to make sure that money and aid gets into the hands of the right people and is not intercepted, and we also have sanctioning tools that we did not really have. Um, we tried to sanction Nazi Germany and its allies and collaborators um, beginning in 1940. That, you know, was a piecemeal program. It was just starting out. Um, we certainly couldn't do the kind of targeted sanctions against the leadership. They were just trying to block and hold, you know, full countries, um, which again, proved a challenge with then getting humanitarian aid into those countries. And so I think, you know, the ad, the progress of technology, the progress of social media, allowing us to know what is happening, you know, that is also a tremendous difference. Um, you know, in 1941 and 1942, as the Nazis are at the peak of mass murder, there aren't reporters on the ground in the United States reporting back. Americans are not seeing photos of what is happening and so that is a, a tremendous difference. You know, you can go online now and see 
pretty much in real time what's happening in Kyiv. Uh, Americans did not have that, which is why, as you saw in the film, there's this question of believability. You know, what does it take for Americans to believe that this has happened? We don't have that question really with Ukraine. So Paul, Michael and Doris both reference the fact that the Holocaust is not something that just uh, recedes into history, it's something that lives with us today. And you, in, in your role with the Fort Ontario Historic Site, are someone who really keeps this mission alive and you know, keeps this chapter of history alive. So what do you have to do to make this something that's engaging with people today? Is it about making parallels with the world today, or, or is the history in and of itself uh, enough to I engage people? Well, I think you have to look at the Holocaust as the, the greatest, most horrific pogrom, um, mass murder on a grand scale, uh, which really separates it from the current situations. Um, that's really how you have to view it. And, um, and the, it, um, in Fort Ontario, uh, it was just one of the uh, um, effects of, uh, of that whole effort to rescue the Jews, but it really it represents um, what those, uh, those 1,000 people represent what could happen if those uh, 6 million people had lived. Um, so. Well, I just think of also the fact that as a refugee settlement, you know, this is something that's in the news constantly. It's not even something that just is a conversation point about our southern border. You, you look in the news in New York City right now, you have asylum seekers who are being bused to New York City. So, I mean, how do you like, think about it th through that lens? Or is that something that, that comes up? Um, we've been trying to make history like al alive today. Yeah, it just, it has to be remembered. Since Fort Ontario is really the only actual Holocaust site in the United States, it's preserved as a shrine to those uh, who were killed, uh, murdered, uh, and it, that needs to be maintained and promoted. Awareness of it has to be raised. You know? Well, and Doris, you have this personal experience as a, a refugee in a country you, you never knew. Like you said, you grew up in, born in Vienna, grew up in, in Italy. So in recent years, New York, especially upstate New York, has become more of a destination for refugees. So when you think about your, your own experience, what goes into making a, a productive resettlement so that people can thrive in, in their new country? I think that I was very fortunate because of my own emotional feelings about myself. Mm -hmm. that, and I think, you know, in reflection of what happened to myself, that I had the fortitude to seek help to find out who I really was and what was I all about. So my whole intent, uh, once I grew up, that I thought the only thing that could possibly save me is if I would achieve the American dream. And that would encompass, because my father died suddenly right. in Oswego, and for me, that was the end of the world. It was the biggest trauma, actually, that I had because I expected to have a certain, a new life that we were going to have. And that I was able to see that Achieving the American dream had many levels. Number one, that I could have a family and have, a, have children and be able to celebrate holidays, to have people come over, to embrace my Judaism, because I felt that here, being able to live in the United States of America, that you could be whoever you want to be and people, and I would be able to respect people, and people would respect me. But then I found out that after I achieved the, the American dream, quote unquote, I had my five children, I had uh, my husband, of course, my dog, my uh, Ford station wagon, my Chevy convertible, and we moved to Kings Point, New York. So to me, wow, this is really something. And then one day I woke up 
and I looked in the mirror and I saw vacant eyes and that really scared me. And I realized that it's not only about the American dream, but being able to fulfill your intellectual and your creative needs. And I was so fortunate because I could never go deep down into depression because I had five kids and a husband to take care of. So that I knew that I had to get uh, help and go into therapy. And luckily, one of my friends who was a psychoanalyst said, I have just the woman for you. And she's a Viennese Freudian analyst. And I would have to drive to Manhattan on the Upper West Side. Which, you know, which car did you take? Huh? Which car did you take? <laughs> right. <laughs> no, what? sorry. Keep going. Which what? I asked which car you, you took. Probably the Ford Station gotcha. wagon. And I had to drive over the Triborough Bridge. And with my own feelings, I, would, I was very scared because I said, what if I killed somebody? So you can imagine. But I got over it, and I had this Viennese analyst who I feel really was able to help me find out who I was and I was able to pursue what I did. And for me, that was the very best education that I could have, that I, uh, could have ever gotten. And with that was my unbelievable friendship that I had with Ruth Gruber who brought us to the United States, and who uh, I found that I always knew about her, but I didn't know her you know, in the camp, of mm -hmm. course, or even in my early adult life. But I was at a uh, Hanukkah party at uh, my friend's home. He was Fred the Furry. I don't know if you remember him. Before and my he, time. What? Before my time. Before your time. Just a couple course, years. Maybe other people knew. But anyway, he said, Doris. I just met a fabulous woman who you should know and meet. Her name is Ruth Gruber, and she was at the opening of the Safe Haven Museum in uh, Albany. And I'm thinking to myself, you know, what for? You know, I don't have very wonderful memories. You know, I've had it's filled with sadness. So my oldest daughter said, Mom, are you going to call her? And I said, no, nah, I don't think so. She said, I'm going to call her. So uh, Laura called her, and she said it was so unbelievable. She found her in the phone book, and she called her and said, Dr. Gruber, my name is Laura, uh, Laura Schechter Chess, and you brought my mother to the United States, and I would like to meet you. And Ruth said, I would be delighted to meet you. Where can we meet? So she said, well, my mother has a restaurant on Madison Avenue. We could meet there. So we met at the restaurant. At, at that time, it was my most favorite dessert company. And we met. And I said, uh, and it was instant uh, connection. And I said to Ruth, could we go to your house and can I look at photographs? Because, you know, she was a journalist, a writer, and she said, of course. And we go to her house and we're looking through the photographs and I, the, the dams burst open and I'm sobbing. And she said, it's okay, Doris, you lost your country. You lost your language, and you lost your father. So, and that was it, and we bonded, and we did a lot together. I'm sorry. No, take your time, it's okay. Well, while you're gathering yourself, it's okay. I, I, I'm gonna pivot away, you can. What? I'm, I'm gonna, I'll let you be okay for a second. Okay, I'm okay. fine. No, you're fine, you're fine. Um, Rebecca, I want to come back to something you said with regards to the use of social media and Ukraine, because in the piece that we just saw a little bit of, they highlight some of the uh, reporting that was done at the time that Americans had access to uh, about what was going on in Europe. So how should we think about those Americans at the time? Were they apathetic? Was there a degree of ignorance? Um, and then also, how do we think about that today? Because 
while there is you know, social media, we are very well aware of humanitarian crisis all over the world. I think of the Uyghurs in China, and we don't necessarily do anything today. So same sort of question, you know, the apathy and ignorance today. Well, there are a couple of things here. Yeah. One is that I think it's challenging to summarize all Americans as one thing, Americans yeah. being apathetic or Americans being this or that, because America is never one thing. Americans do not agree uh, historically on very many things. Americans debate constantly what we should do about information that we're finding. And that was true back in the 30s too. Um, there are waves in which there's a lot of headline news. 1933 in March and April, Nazi Germany and what's happening to Jews there, the early series of persecutions, that is front page news alongside Roosevelt coming into office alongside the New Deal. And there are marches and rallies for those people, the largest march in, uh, protest march in New York City history was in May 1933, timed to book burning, because um, Americans knew that that was about to happen in Germany, and they timed this protest to the day that the Nazis were scheduled to burn books in Germany. But Americans also historically have short attention spans. And so when that falls off, that story falls off the front page, Americans go back to focusing on the depression, on Americans' um, commitment to neutrality, which lasts through the 20s and 30s, um, right up until 1941. Americans, by and large, want to remain isolated on our side of the Atlantic. And so you do have this, um, these periods in which Americans have a lot of information and are paying attention. And then you have periods where they don't have a lot of information uh, and again, aren't paying attention. So it's not, I think you're right that it's not necessarily that Americans are apathetic. There are a lot of competing forces and fears and motives and pressures on Americans. Um, some of it domestic and some of it is that Americans do not know that a genocide is to come. Nobody knows that a genocide, the Nazis don't even know that they're going to be able to put in any plans um, to murder Jews. And so do you pay attention to the Spanish Civil War and the plight of Spanish refugee children? Do you pay attention to the fact that Japan has invaded China in the 30s, that Italy has invaded Ethiopia? There were a lot of places for Americans to look. Uh, Nazi Germany was one of them. Um, and Nazi Germany, you know, and the persecutions of obviously spiral in a different way and, and um, begin a refugee crisis in a different way than the other crises. So by, I would say 1938, it is clear that that something is terrible, something is going terribly wrong in Central Europe. And that's when really uh, Nazi Germany and the plight of European Jews becomes this focus for Americans. But it doesn't mean that Americans are united on what to do about that focus. And I think many Americans thought, well, going to war, you know, when we finally join the war, um, that is their contribution to rescuing not just Jews, but rescuing everybody, um, all of the people who are under Nazi domination. Well, Michael, uh, a recurring narrative of the screen era that we just saw is that it really is supposed to confront the, the American viewer with you know, things that could be uncomfortable about our version of history that we learn. So, Mike, as an educator, how do you think about that type of challenge in terms of challenging people about their assumptions about their own country? And what sort of response do you get if it's a student or just in your everyday life when you hear people who might not have an accurate perception of what you know, our history really is? Well, let's begin that uh, as an educator, it's my task not necessarily to make my students comfortable. But well, to well make they have to make them, them receptive, at least. You know, they have to want to learn. To make them at least inquisitive and willing to uh, face the complexities of the history that's involved. And I find tremendous interest in the Holocaust. I try, ironically, not so much to make connections as to respond to the connections that the students make. And that is that I don't want to... I want to teach the history, and then respond to the way in which the students ask the question, as the audience will ask this question, will ask the question watching this, what does this history have to tell me? And once we respond to those questions, they're important. 
let's take uh, and and the other thing that that we have in watching this entire series is we know how it's ending they did know did not know how it was going to end and we also know that there were chapters so for example um the chapter of 1938 that we didn't quite uh, see is the chapter that ends with the German expansion into Austria in uh, March. It ends with the Avion Conference. 32 nations say we have a, a refugee problem and nobody comes forth to solve it. It ends with the, uh, uh, or it continues with the pacification and the appeasement of uh, Hitler uh, in, um, in the Munich conference of September 1938. It then has the expulsion of Jews from uh, Pol uh, uh, German Jews, um, uh, Jews living in Germany who were of Polish origin back to Poland. And then it culminates in the burning of synagogues, which resonated the burning of synagogues, the uh, destruction of Jewish businesses in the pogroms of 1938 known as Kristallnacht. And that's a moment at which America understands that its fundamental right value, freedom of religion is under attack. It's when America becomes most active and we have a wall-to-wall -wall opposition to what happened to Kristall, Kristallnacht. President said, I can scarcely believe that a civilized people would behave like this. But nothing moved, 90%, in excess of 90% opposed what happened in Kristallnacht. But there was not a significant change in the idea that we should welcome refugees. And we didn't even use the word Jewish refugees because that would have increased the opposition. There was tremendous anti-Semitism in the, in the United States. And after a period of time, the question is, what do we do with this and how do we respond? That's a very different question to confront the American people. And uh, we also had a second problem that Rebecca uh, touched on, which is that the Germans actually fought two wars during the years 1940, 1939 through 45, most especially 41 through 45. They fought a world war and they fought a racial war, what we might call the war against the Jews. The United States fought one war, the world war, and it felt only at the end of the war could it do something about these people. And by then, the frank truth was, the, the absolute truth was, it was too late. And we did not recognize how deep and profound a priority the Germans gave to the annihilation of the Jewish people. So this program is a way for people who want to be educated, want to learn more, to actively uh, get engaged with their past. But uh, there are obviously people who, you know, God forbid, are actually not going to be watching PBS and uh, picking up on all this. And you know, I guess they exist somewhere. Um, but so that really highlights the need to educate the people. You know, where we do the educating, public schools, for example. And uh, in my day job, I cover the state capitol, and one of the big issues there uh, was making sure that the Holocaust is, is part of the, the curriculum, and there was legislation directing the state education department uh, to you know, get the ball rolling on that. And you know, Paul, as someone with a background in education programming, what do you think needs to be part of any sort of comprehensive Holocaust uh, education? And is the Holocaust something that we probably need to teach in, in sort of an, an evolving way as you know, kids get older and can handle probably more nuance? Yes, certainly we should handle it at all levels in, in different grades. Um, you have to focus on um, you know, the key issues. Um, and, and at Fort Ontario, what we focus on is the fort's historical significance of the Fort Ontario Emergency Refugee Shelter. Um, number one, it's where the Holocaust came to America, where Everyday Americans, Oswegonians, first met the victims of the Nazis, heard their tales of persecution, flight, and murder, and they could relate to them. Okay, they met an offense. Um, they became their advocates. Uh, they began to advocate for allowing them to remain in the United States. Uh, another lesson for Ontario is, uh, 
It's where the American press, which had, as we heard uh, today, have really buried Holocaust stories in the back pages for 12 and a half years of uh, Hitler's reign of terror. But at Fort Ontario, these reporters get a story they can get their teeth into, they can relate to these people, personal stories. And in a way, Holocaust sto stories move from the back to the front pages of American newspapers because of what happened at Fort Ontario. I think the other lesson uh, or point is that Fort Ontario is the first instance of refugees being allowed into the United States outside the immigration quota system. Um, that hadn't happened before. And that really opened the doors for later groups of refugees, right? So it's really the birthplace, for better or worse, of American refugee policy. And these are the lessons or the main points that I hit at uh, Fort Ontario and the, uh, at the Safe Haven Holocaust Refugee Shelter Museum. Well, Doris, I'll give you the same you know, general question. If you were uh, in charge of educating uh, our, our youth, what do you think is important for them uh, to take away from the Holocaust? Is it just about numbers? You can recite two-thirds of yeah. Jews died. Is it about individual stories like yourself? What, what do you think I, makes I a think good education? I think that it was interesting. Um, a friend of mine who actually did uh, the photographs for my first book I said to me, uh, I'm speaking, because she was also the producer for the film that I was a, uh, an executive producer of on, for Ruth Gruber's uh, documentary ahead of time. And she said, I'm speaking at um, the uh, Solomon Schechter School in West Orange, New Jersey, and I think that you should come and speak also, she said because I am showing them the trailer that I was involved in, in Renee and I, which was a, um, a documentary on twins that were, uh, what do you call it, were uh, performed by Mengele's. You know, they did the uh, perform, uh, um, the experiments of the Dr. Experiments, Mengele. Thank you. So, you know, when she told me that, I said, oh, how could I come and speak about my experience when they're going to see a film on the experimentation of uh, twins by Mengele's? She said, I said, I don't think I can come. You know, it doesn't jive. And then I came home and I thought about it. I said, no matter what, I am still part and parcel of the Holocaust. I didn't experience that. I've experienced other fears and experiences that we had and the traumas. So I decided that I am going to tell them my story because there were 500 kids involved. So I thought, well, what am I going to do? So I decided that I would bring 500 chocolate chip cookies so that <laughs> everyone in the audience would go off with the sweet feeling that there is a possibility that people go through and overcome experiences. And um, because I reflected on something that when I was in grade school, my best friend, when I would tell her some of the stories, she said, Doris, you're so lucky that you're not a lampshade. I just could not believe that reaction. So if you weren't at the worst part and you were lucky enough to, you know, to come to, without too much, uh, uh, what do you call it again, scars, so to speak, that um, it's important, and, and for me, the most important thing are the children that, uh, that go through such traumas and are able, as they grow up, to talk about it, to be able to overcome it, and find out what they can do to give back. That's it. Rebecca, I'm interested in the same sort of question for you. What do you think is important in a Holocaust curriculum? And is it something that gets explored, say, as the chapters make their way through World War II, or is it part of a broader discussion about, you know, America's shortcomings? 
Well, I think this film is going to help it go beyond just being the chapter at the end of World War II. There are some states, I don't think New York State is one of them, but there are some states where the actual state educational standard is that the Holocaust is a consequence of World War II. And of course, that's not true. Um, and, and it's taught that way. You go through all of the war and then you get to liberation and then you go back and say, well, also this was happening. And that gives students the impression that Americans did not know anything at the time, that there was no really robust American response and that Americans are surprised at liberation, which is not the case. Um, and so I think this film and hopefully the lesson plans that are going along with it will help, stu uh, help students and teachers integrate it into their study of the 1920s, when they talk about isolationism, when they talk about um, US immigration quotas, when they get to the 30s and they talk about the rise of Hitler, you can incorporate a, an American response lens into that. I think there are a couple of really key factors um, and key things that teachers need to explore. And one is the fact that this is a racial anti-Semitism. Um, so often students will ask, well, why didn't Jews just convert? And there's an answer to that, which is that the Nazis saw Jews as a race, as a separate race. And so it's important for students to understand that. Uh, it's important for students to understand that Jews in Germany was, were a tiny minority of the population, um, that really it is German territorial expansion that allowed Germany to have access to large Jewish communities and to have no witnesses or very few witnesses uh, to what they were planning to do. That war makes a lot possible. Um, and in this case, World War II made the Holocaust possible for the Nazis. Um, and that Americans are debating these things, that there was a robust response um, later on. Well, I'm sorry, a robust set of information that led to a response um, that by 1944, Americans have enough information that the US government does decide to make rescue uh, official American policy. Um, they say that it, it cannot interfere with the war effort, but that a group of American bureaucrats, American government, government officials can do what they um, can start to put together plans to try to rescue Jews. Uh, this is one of the things that leads to the opening of the Fort Ontario Emergency Refugee Shelter in August 1944, is this idea that we need to encourage other nations in Europe to start to accept refugees over their borders. They are turning around and saying the United States is not doing so. And so very quickly, the United States decides to open this shelter, um, bring a thousand, about a thousand refugees to live there, and as Paul said, this is the birth of American refugee policy. Um, these, this is the first group of people who are brought to the United States outside of the immigration system. Um, and it does lead to a lot of discussion after the war of what do we do with displaced persons? What do we do with people who are fleeing persecution? Having them go through the immigration system doesn't seem to be working. And so Fort Ontario is really the birthplace of that. And if anybody in your audience has not been up to the Safe Haven Museum and has not been to the Fort Ontario site, I really encourage you to go. Um, it's a beautiful site and a really well curated museum. And this is a local story um, and a pretty incredible one that everyone in our country should know about. Well, finally, Michael, uh, instead of how we educate kids, uh, I'll have you kind of end by telling us, you know, if people have seen this program now and you know, what should they do in the wake of this, aside from going to WCNY.org and obviously becoming a supporter of, of the station and obviously visiting the Fort Ontario Historic Site, what would you recommend they do if they want to continue to, to learn about this as an adult? Let me add one thing. Um, this is not only an American story. This is profoundly a story about totalitarian regimes and what they can do. And it's an infusion of a commitment to democracy, to human rights and human dignity, the notion of inalienable rights, to American values, including the separation of powers and checks and balances, and the notion of fundamental rights, including life and liberty, freedom of the press, freedom of assembly, freedom of religion. So when I teach the Holocaust, and this is also true with uh, everything else, I'm teaching the best of American values, even at a point when, American, when America fell short. 
And I always believe that you teach history along with narrative, because one of the most profound things is to embody the notion of six million, not as an abstract figure, but the story of one person, two people, three people, people like you and me that create an identification. What can people do with this story? They can, one, take a look at what's happening in the world today with different eyes. Not only the Ukrainian refugee problem and not only the genocide that's occurring in China. They can look at the rise of anti-Semitism, the proliferation of racism, the notion of violence that's taking place. They can certainly visit the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum for an infusion. They can watch any number of important uh, documentaries, most especially this one. And they can also be concerned to make sure that we preserve, protect, and defend the democracy that we have because we've learned in the last seven or eight or 10 years that our democracy is not only precious, but that it's precarious. And we have to uh, defend that democracy, uh, most especially against those who want to topple it from within. Well, unfortunately, that's all the time we have for our discussion today. I want to thank our panelists for lending us their time and expertise. And a big thank you to everyone behind the camera who made today's program possible. We hope you enjoyed our presentation. And remember that the premiere of The U.S. and the Holocaust will be right here on WCNY-TV on Sunday, September 18th at 8 p.m. Thanks for watching. Thank you for joining us tonight. And don't miss the premiere of The U.S. and the Holocaust, September 18th at 8 p.m. on WCNY-TV.